Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome. Um, I want to thank everyone so much for coming. I'm excited to see you all here. So in case we haven't met, um, my name is uh, Dr. Beth Gilmore. I am an assistant professor here in the Department of Criminal Justice and Social Work. And I'm really, really excited um, to be hosting um, these two speakers today on campus. So a little bit of information about myself is that I spent the bulk of my career prior to coming to UHD working with victims of crime. Um, and mostly, predominantly working with child abuse victims. And I did that for years and years. And um, in 2019, I had the opportunity while I was a faculty member here at UHD to attend the Crimes Against Children's Conference in Dallas. If you're unfamiliar with this conference, it's recognized as the leading conference in the world on the topic of child abuse and exploitation. And while I was at the conference, kind of by happen chance, I, I went into a presentation that was hosted by these two gentlemen. And I remember thinking, I know a lot about online exploitation. I know a lot about trying to keep kids safe on the internet. This is kind of my area and I know a lot about it. Um, and I remember sitting in that panel and my mouth just dropping. Of all the things that I didn't know, of all the information that I was unaware of, and I left that presentation thinking to myself, there has to be more that we can do. And this is such an important topic. Um, it's such a current and pressing topic when we think about what goes on on the internet and what happens. Um, it's a scary place. And I've often heard the internet referred to as a predator's playground. And this is something that we all need to be talking about and we all need to be thinking about. Um, and I want to commend everyone who's come today. I got emails from students and faculty telling me that uh, this topic was a really tough topic. And it is. I mean, arguably, just based on who's seated in this room, let alone who's online, we know that we have survivors in this room of abuse. And so I think it's very brave and very commendable um, that you all are here to be a part of learning about this topic, um, you know, having a discussion with some of the top professionals in the field, and educating yourself so that when you go out into the field and you're doing your impact on future you know, individuals, whether you're working in a service capacity with victims and even with offenders, that you're aware of, of what's going on. So it's my pleasure, really and truly, to host um, Tony and Brandon. Um, please feel free. We're going to have some time for questions at the end. If you're joining us online, um, you can feel free to put your questions in the chat. We're going to kind of monitor them. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get some questions at the end as well. But I'm going to let them take it away because I hope you all will find this presentation just as um, engaging and as educational as, as I did. Gentlemen? Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Tony Godwin. I'm a detective with the Garland uh, Police Department in North Texas. Uh, so the kind of the uh, eastern side of northeastern corner of Dallas touches my city. I've been with, Dow uh, with Garland for 30 years, and I've been on what's called the Northern Texas ICAC Task Force for 18 of my 30 years, so a very long time. When Moby Dick was a minnow is when I started, uh, and I am long in the saddle. Um, I've had great, great success, and I'm really honored to come down here to share with you. This is a, a pretty special presentation that we worked really hard on, and I think you're going to get a lot of uh, information from it, and so we'll be respectful of time. and. Let Brandon get going. My name is Brandon Poor. I'm a, a police detective in Grand Prairie. We're just outside of Dallas, between Dallas and Arlington, so we can see Dallas out one side of our department and Jerry World, the Death Star, out the other side. I'm sorry, Cowboy Stadium, out the other side. Um, and I've been a detective for 10 years in crimes against children. I've been a police officer for 18 years, and I'm assigned full-time to a federal child exploitation and human trafficking task force. Um, which all of that to say for the North Texas Task Force and the Federal Task Force, it's just fancy ways of saying we have a lot of work to do. Um, we are acting in undercover proactive capacities to, um, to lure those predators who seek children online. And hopefully, 
We meet them before they meet a real child. And uh, so we work the crimes that happen online to a child under the age of 18 uh, that involves child exploitation. So you're going to hear tonight kind of a broad overview of the things that we're seeing with the present day predators and kind of sort of understand with a little bit of, of the time that we have tonight, it's like drinking through a fire hose, we say, um, because there's such a uh, a vast amount of information about this topic. So we're just gonna kind of gloss over the overview um, of some of the big things and then allow you guys uh, plenty of time to ask any questions that you may have as well. So we start by saying, who has social media? Everyone, there's like, I see all the room, hands up in the room pretty much, almost. Anybody not have social media? Oh, we'll talk to you afterwards because you're rare. Congratulations, we're gonna meet with you privately. So how much, for those of you who do, how much are you paying for your social media each month? Like, what do you have? Uh, who's got Twitter? Anyone Twitter? Facebook? That's for us old people. You're right. No offense. Instagram? How much, how much are you paying for your Instagram subscription each month? You don't pay anything. Okay. Who, who, someone else? You don't pay either? Facebook? It's free. Well, you know, our parents always taught us nothing in life is free. And if nothing in life is free, what is the cost? Well, ultimately, you are the cost. Your habits, your information, uh, your details, your lives are the cost to these social media companies. They spend a lot of time preparing and delivering this information with much research in what you're going to do with it. There's a word for this, that constant pull to refresh. Um, those things that they research and spend a lot of time and money developing. And what is it called? Doom scrolling. How many of you are subject to that? How many of you have TikTok in here? Oh, look at all the It's the funniest stuff on the internet today, right? I'm a victim of TikTok. He's a victim of TikTok. If they want to laugh at me for looking at the, the jokes I watch or the cooking things that I... It's know, how we eat. keep relevant. Yeah with TikTok. It's doom scrolling though. You sit and you pull to refresh and you constantly compare and look and watch. And what does that lead to? Of course, it's leading to intensified fear, anxiety, comparison, all of these things that we see in each other as adults. Now you as an adult are a subject of this research and this phenomenon. So how much more so if you are a victim of this are your children and the children that you know in the community of this who maybe haven't thought about or developed the things that you have to withstand these problems. And that's why we're seeing such a vast amount of exploitation and victimization of children on the World Wide Web. So we start with this wonderful thing that everyone dreads to hear about. It's a horrible, heinous, evil thing on the internet. And we don't call it this anymore. Why don't we call it this? Because we actually call it this. It's not child pornography, it's child sexual abuse material. And the reason that we changed from hearing child pornography is because pornography involves consenting adults and only adults can consent. And since a child cannot consent, it is the, child, the brutal rape of a child forever memorialized on video and imagery. And so we want to make sure every time we speak to an audience of people, we always want to make sure that we are stressing the importance of how horrible this thing is. Because we hear people talk sometimes and sort of dismissively say, well, yeah, it's bad, but the hands-on abuse is worse. Um, and in our minds, they are on equal playing field. They are the same. The hands-on abuse is heinous, but this is also heinous. And so we start by showing you some information about this. So, age that abuse begins, what we can say statistically, because we know we've worked these cases, about ha a little more than half the time, it's going to be before the age of five. And why would that be? Simply because they're nonverbal, usually up to a certain age, and so there's less chances that someone's going to get caught. And then it increases a little bit, 31% at 6 to 11 years of age, and then 12 and over, or 12% for 11 and over. Sometimes there's no outcries whatsoever were never made aware of these situations and so this is where we're trying to educate people to make an understanding of it is okay to come forward because there is help and we always try to emphasize the fact that child exploitation 
is a smaller subset umbrella under the larger umbrella that is known as child sexual abuse. Um, and even a smaller subset under the child exploitation is trafficking. And so if you understand that the dynamics of child sexual abuse are also true in child exploitation and then trafficking, then you'll understand these next statistics that tell us that a large majority of the offenders that are committing child sexual abuse material or CSAM offenses are primary caregivers and within the home. We know in child sexual abuse cases that a vast majority, 94 to 96% of offenders in child sexual abuse cases are known to the child, a family friend, a family member, or a family acquaintance, and a very small percentage is unknown or a stranger to the child. So that makes sense that then if the child sexual abuse is happening that way, that the child sexual abuse material is happening that way as well. 42% of solo offenders are the father or stepfather. It's a sad fact. Men, the large majority of child sexual abusers are men. It's a very small statistic that they are female, although we believe that it is highly underreported because males don't outcry at the same way that female victims do, and female offenders often get lesser sentences because of that. 54% of solo offenders live with the victim full time, and 89% of those who arranged sexual contact were parents or caregivers of the children. Now that's usually a very shocking statistic because most people don't even equate, what are you talking about, a parent or a trusted adult in a child's life that offers that person up or that child up for an experience, and that is a very real statistic. A lot of places we go and speak, we tell that to people and most people are like, what? Like you just can't wrap your mind around it, but it is a very real thing. Now, we're showing you a lot of information and of course the, the statistics tell a lot and tell a story, but most powerfully, what we want to tell you is what do the survivors say? And there was a study by the Canadian Center for Child Protection done in 2017 where they anonymously surveyed survivors of CSAM offenses and we want to show you their statements. This is a survivor statement, and I'll just highlight one of the big points. The hands-on abuse was horrible, but at the very least, it's over and done with. The constant sharing of the abuse will never end. Therefore, the reminder of its existence will never end. And if you ask me, a crime that will never end is worse than the one that is over, no matter how much more serious it may appear. That's something inescapable. So we often put it this way. While the offender may get, sadly, sometimes probation or deferred adjudication, community supervision, sometimes they may get a couple of years, five or 10 years in prison, this victim will have a life sentence because when their hands-on abuse is over, these videos and images will go on for the lifetime. And I often think of it this way. The hands-on abuse is their story to tell. When they've gone through restorative, storage, uh, restorative services like therapy and counseling, they get to choose. They take that power back and get to choose who they tell that to. That's their story to tell. These videos and images, though, are always the chance is there for them to be found. And so that Band-Aid gets ripped off anytime those are found. And that's, that victim never gets the sense of, I can keep this to myself or tell who I want to because there's always the fear that they're going to be found. This is what this one says. These images will always be out there and I can't predict when and how they will affect my life by hearing of people being caught with them or being stalked by someone who has seen them. The threat's always there and I'm always dreading when it will come up. And they also mess with my identity because I'm shocked at the number of people who have viewed them and seen the worst moments of my life and convinced themselves that I enjoy them. So there's a lot to unpack here, and I, I want to let Tony talk in a second about a guy that we interviewed. First of all, I want to say that we have been on the dark web forums where horrible offenders are talking about these children, these children child victims as though they were adult film stars, talking about if they could find them in real life, what they would do to them as adults. And so the fact that this survivor is saying, I'm always fearful of being stalked or identified or found, resonates because we've seen the offenders saying that very thing. Um, the other thing is the, the shock at the number of people. Now, we're a little bit skewed because we work in this field. We think my gosh, there's like everyone's looking at this stuff. Well, yes, everyone we arrest is looking at this stuff. I know not everyone is, 
but you would be shocked as a public to find out how many people, your neighbors, your teachers, your pastors, your doctors, your nurses, your lawyers, your plumbers, your everyone that is looking at this, and it's a secret crime. They'll never know until they, they get out it, and so someone that you know may be looking at this very material. I can give you a real world example for in my city alone, it's such a prolific crime. It's happening so often, so much. If I had the manpower at my disposal, the man hours, the finances to handle it, I could literally arrest a, one person a day, every day, for probably a two or three year period in my city alone. And I would never even come close to running out of offenders to go after. It's how prolific this issue really is. It's and then lastly, I'll point out that we both went on a case and Tony and I spoke to the offender who said, well, I only look at the stuff where the kids are enjoying it. He had convinced himself that the kids were a willing participant of this, and he only looked for those. Not knowing that what we know from survivors directly is that they've told us, if I didn't do exactly what I was directed to do, I would be made to do it and punished until I did it the right way. And so that is a lie that they are telling themselves to make themselves feel better about what they're doing. Lastly, I'll just show you this one. On top of having fear for my life every day that someone could potentially find me, I'm constantly being degraded by people that I've never even met who have bad intentions and don't believe they're harming anyone. These people are mentally unstable and need to be locked up. My ch child sexual abuse imagery is out there for anyone to see. I will forever be taken advantage of, and it's not something that will ever go away. We don't put these up here to depress you. We put these up here to show you that the victims themselves have said, this is the same as the hands-on abuse to us because it is something that they will deal with for the rest of their lives. And yet, a lot of times we see, especially in areas where we see courts give out probation and community supervision and things like that, that these offenses are considered a lesser offense to the hands-on abuse. These, those courageous statements that he just walked through, uh, those victims have allowed the use of those statements in court when someone's been convicted, and when you can bring those into a courtroom for sentencing to give them more closure, sometimes they get uh, remuneration, they get paid, uh, because there's a, a punishment or a fee that's assigned to a subject who is distributing or downloading those imagery uh, of that victim. And, and you saw the very last line, it said, as an adult. And the major almost all of these now were victimized at such a young age, they now have their own families. And so this is such an important thing and such an empowering thing for someone who's been through trauma like that to be able to allow that to be used in a court setting. It's, it's fantastic for us. So we go on to self-generated CSAM. This is where the child is making this imagery or videos of themselves either at someone else's direction or to send to someone at their request. Um, and so what you should take note of here, these are some statistics coming from Thorn. And I know it might be hard for you to see, but these are some of the platform usage habits that kids have reported anonymously they're using each day. Now, what do you take away from this? And let me go to the next one. Here's another one. What do you take away from this? These are the platforms what? That you're using. These are the platforms that are on all of your devices, all of your friends' devices, all of your family's devices. And why does that matter? Because that's where the kids are, which means that's where the predators are. And so we're going to show you some statistics about self-generated CSAM. Some of the statistics coming from Thorne, used to be Ashton Kutcher's company, um, have talked to us about, yeah, no, that wasn't meant as a joke, sorry. Um, have talked to, they're coming from kids where they're saying, this is what I'm seeing. And so what are you seeing? The big ones, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and Messenger are being reported by kids as places where they've had what they describe as a sexual interaction with what they believe is an adult. Yeah. So one in six minors have, t have said and openly said anonymously that they have shared their own self-generated material. And that's a very troubling statistic that we need to change. And it has to start from this level and, our, and higher and work its way down. And so two and three have shared their own uh, material within just the, in the last, last year. year. Like it's happening every day. This is a normal behavior for a lot of kids. And unfortunately, the ages of these kids are getting younger and younger. Middle school is absolutely in play. Now it's elementary school. 
And because we used to know that kids were exposed to pornography at 12, 13 years old, now they're being exposed much younger. We've seen seven, eight, nine years old to exposed to pornography. And if that's their idea of normal sexual development, you can understand why they're doing more and more heinous things at the request of others. One in five minors reported that they had seen non-consensually reshared self-generated CSAM. Yep, one in eight have uh, reported that they've seen it get reshared, and then 6% between this age range of 9 to 17 actually went to someone they trust. Go to a parent, go to a trusted teacher, go to a school resource officer, go to someone that they can say with some confidence that, hey, this just happened and, and we need to get this resolved. What's sad is, uh, is one in six are sharing it. Only 6% went to someone and said, hey, I've shared this. Um, what are they worried about, Tony? What, yeah, this is why they've decided not to share. And remember that this survey comes in, and it's a blind survey of real kids, and so these are real good statistics to go by and base things on. And the fact that it's going to get leaked or shared is what their number one concern is, the fact that it'll get leaked, that their parents are going to find out. That's, in my opinion, if I had never seen this study, that's what I would have believed number one to be, because nobody wants to lose that phone. Nobody wants to lose that device. Every kid is worried that their parent is going to, they feel like their arm got amputated because they lost that device. Now, some ugly cop like us coming into the school and saying, it's illegal, is the least concerning thing for them. And that did not shock us at all. Because us coming in and going, it's illegal, matters very little. What matters more is, what do my parents, my peers think of me, and I'm afraid it might get leaked and shame me. Again, we're seeing 2019 to 2021 about the same across the board um, in that how they're sharing it. We, we've seen no change. We've seen it be pretty consistent. Um, the thing that's changed, oh, sorry, that's a good one. Uh, the 38% of kids reported having a secondary account that their parents don't know about. So parents, you should expect that your child probably has an account you don't know about, that they're sharing with their friends, and they have one that you might be able to see that probably has very little on it. We'll show you a trick for that shortly. <laughs> so among those kids who have shared nudes, 42% per, uh, percent reported that they had shared it with someone 18 or over. So nudes, you know, that's the term that's been um, used for years with kids sharing these things, are no longer a peer-to-peer -peer shared thing. These are things that kids are reporting themselves. I share it with Kids my age and people older than 18. Yeah, 25% of those in that age range of 9 to 17 that they've had a sexual interaction or encounter with someone who they believe to be an adult. That's a very, very troubling statistic. And only 37% of those who had that interaction shared it with a caregiver. This is the big change. 60% yeah. predominantly blame the reshare. Now, why is that significant? Because just a few years ago, when the studies came out, it was flip-flop. 60% blamed the person who took the photo, and 40% blamed the resharer. Now it's switched. And what that told us when we saw that is that kids, two things, kids are not going to take self-responsibility for that. They would be much more upset with the person sharing it than the person taking it. And it is so common and so normal for this to be happening that you don't blame yourself for taking a picture because everyone's doing that. What you blame is the person who shared it without your permission. Yeah, uh, this is a very troubling thing that's going to, he's going to pop up here in just a second. Uh, what 58% of the parents have told us, right, that they don't know what to do. If something like this happens in their home, in their household, has already happened, they are telling us that they're clueless on what they can do to remedy that situation. We kind of counter that a little bit because as we prepare for some of these or maybe we have a little time beforehand, we see a lot of parents in the audience that are on their smartphones, right? Checking in on their social media and doing all kinds of stuff. And so it's not necessarily you don't understand it or they don't understand it. It's trying to figure out what's the best resource to, to move it forward in a productive way. We are seeing the status is showing a lot of abuse and child exploitation. But uh, parents, the problem is the parents are very disconnected from the kids. Yes. And they are working many hours, and mm -hmm. the kid is alone. And what I see, mothers who give the kid, even though it's like six months with the iPad, the kid is like 
touching everything that is not allowed for, even for babies. Yeah. And maybe accidentally the kids are taking these pictures. Uh, I think the, the change should start for family, uh, that they need to be like, there are apps, I think, so that they can control or block some some of these uh, and we're going to show you some of those things. We're going to show you some of the apps that are dangerous, some of the apps that you can use to control, and some techniques. The question was, what do we do about it? And that's, first of all, you're here. You're taking a step. You're listening. You're getting awareness. And you're going to learn some techniques um, and tips that we're going to give. Um, but we'll also give some like general, what do parents do about it? Stick with us. Good question, though. These are some statistics that just came out last year, and they are more troubling. One in three caregivers sent a nude of themselves. So what we say is if one in three parents and caregivers are sending nudes, then of course, why are the kids going to feel like there's anything wrong with them doing it? Of those caregivers who had shared their own nudes, four, they were four times more likely to think their child had participated in that. 21% of caregivers had a conversation about this with their children. And the most shocking and disturbing one is that one in four caregivers surveyed believe the receiver of the image has the absolute right to reshare it if they so choose. Now, what that tells us is parents have this mindset already. Not all of them, but these ones that were surveyed did. And if that's the case, then of course, why would they have a conversation? Why would they care? Why would they say, what should we do? Because there's no problem if they are already thinking that way. So we have to rethink what's appropriate for an adult and what you should be able to instruct to your kid about this problem. Grooming is a, a huge thing that we would like to talk about. We want to make sure everybody is sort of up to speed because this is a situation of building trust. That's what these guys do. We see in the online aspect because I promise you, Brandon says we're the ugliest 12-year-old girls online. I say we're the hottest uh, and because we have a lot of very good success with it. But we see this happen far more rapidly online than we do in regular hands-on cases where we know it's usually familial or someone that's uh, a position of trust with them. So this builds up as a trust situation, and that's first and foremost, and it happens very, very, very rapidly. And we see grooming in every hands-on child sexual abuse case, every single one. What people don't often think of is the fact that it's also happening in every single online interaction that kids have with a predator. Um, it's happening much faster. So that grooming happens at light speed because there's an anonymity, there's a, uh, uh, an expectation that we don't have the time to build a years-long trust relationship, so we need to do this quickly. And one thing that we've said um, just recently a lot is, how many of you have a best friend? Everyone's like, yes. How long have you known? Did you raise your hand? How long have you known that best friend? 15 years. Someone else? Anybody? Has anyone known their best friend for less than a day? You just met your best friend today, and they have been your best friend since. But what does a kid do? When they make a friend online, they met that person five minutes ago. That's their friend. Now they trust them implicitly. And they do things with someone that they have just met five, ten minutes ago that you would never think to do with someone that you've known for five years because you're thinking of it in a different way than their minds now do because they've just been raised with this technology. The next level of grooming, they, they move on to things like favoritism, showing special treatment to a child. These are all things that, you know, by themselves, they could be pretty innocent and innocuous. But when we start to see that trust, that favoritism, the showing special attention to one child, the, the real telltale sign that it's grooming is the violation, the boundary violations. And that's where we move to separation and alienation, where they're pulling the child away from everyone else. I'm your only friend. You can only trust in me. And moving them away from the parents and caregivers into the boundary violation right there. And the violation is oftentimes a sexual violation, talking about body development, um, sexual behavior, and things that n a normal adult who is just showing special attention to a child in a caregiver situation would not cross. And then lastly, manipulation control is what this all exists about. This is the crux of grooming, and so this is what it's all about for them. They're going to have every answer to every question that this child would have, whether it's legit or not. 
And in some circumstances, it turns into manipulation, where if the child is not doing what they are being groomed to do, then there may be some other aspects that come in, and that's where we see sextortion and some other things start to play a role. I'll harm your family, I'll do something to your family pet, something along those lines. Uh, but it's a very big balance of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. I heard that in a, in a hands-on case once where the offender showed the child a picture of a mutilated dog of the same species that they had or the same um, uh, breed that they had and told the child, if you tell someone about this, this will be your dog. And that child loved that dog, and so that was a very strong manipulation and control tactic to keep the child from outcrying. One of our friends, Dr. Tanner, which you talked about. He's a psychologist. He's, a, uh, he's literally the expert on grooming. He wrote the paper on child grooming. And he told us, generally, if you have a good relationship with a child, you're showing that child the emotional um, and uh, relational needs that, that you would as a parent or caregiver. They're going to be generally ungroomable, primarily because you're meeting the emotional needs of that child and they, the offender won't have the opportunity to move into that vulnerable space and meet that child's needs. Sextortion is such a thing that's on the rise. It's very prominent in our worlds in this, uh, in this crime type. We're seeing this on a couple of different levels and essentially what this is is just a blackmail, a form of blackmail. There's usually a couple of different uh, types one being financial, that's really just a numbers game. Uh, we see a lot of uh, young men, uh, grown men sometimes, who are subject to this, and it's really for financial means and it's a numbers deal. So what they'll do is they'll hit somebody up as soon as they get an inappropriate image from that person, typically a male, is then they begin to extort them, well now you're gonna pay me this, or I'm gonna send all of this to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers, to whoever. And with these young, young men, typically, they're getting to a point where they don't have an outlet for that. We've seen suicide become an option, and that's not a good thing. Uh, there is a whole other sexual component of it uh, that usually involves more ladies and young ladies in that arena. Yeah, it used to be that sextortion was primarily sexually motivated. Now the financially motivated has been such a problem in the last few years, and people ask us oftentimes, like, why would they target a kid for financial sextortion? Well, they're not just seeking money. Sometimes they are seeking money. Sometimes they're telling the child to get the money from their parents. Sometimes they're seeking gift cards or game-related things. Um, but oftentimes, the kids try to handle it themselves, and that's how we see them leading to spir the spiraling mental health and, and ending up in suicide. And the thing to take away from this is these are not kids who are coming from the the bad homes and the kids that are in the bad, the, the kids that are super vulnerable. These are kids from good homes. Like These are your kids that are being sextorted. These are the popular kids. These are the football players, the cheerleaders, the smart kids in the, in the school, the, the theater kids, the jocks. These are every kid. The sextortion is happening so frequently, and it's happening on the platforms you know very well. Uh, we'll give you a couple of the statistics on that. It's happening. Um, the one in four victims were 12 or younger when they were threatened um, before the age of 16, and that 60% were um, threatened within two weeks of initial contact. And typically, as we've said already in here, these are hap this is not a dark web problem. This is happening on the same platforms that you're using every day. There are so many problems on the surface internet that we don't even have time to worry about the dark web because happening on the exploitation, or the platforms the exploitation is happening on are the ones that every kid is on right now. Some of the signs and symptoms, look, warning signs, yes, you can take note of some of these. The biggest warning sign is when a child goes from normal, their everyday self, to now something's different. Now something's, they're quiet, they're not acting like themselves. That's the time to dig in and figure out what happened at that time where they went from what they were to what they are now. And that's the biggest warning sign. This was, um, uh, someone asked of a child predator, how did you get kids to trust you? And he said, I would be whoever they wanted me to be. And that's oftentimes what we're seeing is the predators, when we're acting as kids, 
are trying to meet the need, they're trying to slide in and be whatever is the vulnerability in the child's life. Whatever is the need, that's what they're going to try and fill. And as we said, or as you kind of brought up already, this is not a tech issue. This is a parenting issue. You can't just put a parenting monitoring app on a kid's phone and call it good and everything's fine because that's not going to solve the problem. So this is a parenting issue, and I think it's going to start from that. We'll give you some advice on that as well. So this is a real-world dialogue. I've tried to cut out the graphic points. Um, but I tell you this story because I have permission to tell it from the victim. Um, I started chatting with this individual right in 2020 during the lockdown. It was summer. I was a 13-year-old online. I was talking to this individual. He was sending me horrible stuff, which I have shared from sharing, or I have saved you from sharing with you tonight. Um, and only I had to see this horrible stuff. Oh, I had to see it too. Well, I made him see it. But otherwise, um, I was the only one having to deal with this. And my hope was, hey, if I'm talking to this guy, maybe he's not talking to a real kid. Um, I talked to him for about a month or two before I decided when I learned who he was, I needed to go stop this right now because he was a 20-year pastor of a church. And he was also a Boy Scout leader and teaching private music lessons to kids in his home. So we went and served a warrant. Tony got the great privilege of talking to him privately one-on-one -on -one while I started digging into his computers and cell phones. And what we found out is that there was actually a victim that he talked to every day from the time she was about 11 or 12 until she was 18. And she told us in the interview, between the ages of 13 and 15, every single night, they would go on an online platform that would do live video and they would do sexual things together. And these are some of the, the the conversations that I found between them. I'm about to shower, I'll talk in a bit, she says. Okay, but you can turn your video on and let me watch if you want. And of course they have this back and forth, nope. Okay, I'll try and stay awake till you return. Good night. Now he's telling her some things to do sexually. I'm going to pass by so that you don't have to endure it, but I'm gonna show you where we get to in a moment because he's telling her to do sexual things and he says, Will you still love me next year when you're 16? So there's no question he knew exactly how old she was. She was 15 at the time. Of course I will, she says. Why wouldn't I? Then maybe we could actually meet when you're legal. I don't know. How would we do that? And then they talk a bit. And she says, damn, I wish you were 18. Why are all the good ones too old and too far away? And he says, why are all the good ones illegal and far away? This is great evidence in court, by the way. This is lovely statements to bring forward for a prosecution. There's absolutely no denying the fact that he had uh, a predisposition for children. And she told us, and she told me at the beginning of the interview, no, I don't need therapy, I'm good, you know, it's been a long time. And then by the end of the interview, three hours later, she said, you know, I'm gonna take you up on that. I didn't realize, first of all, how groomed I was, and second of all, how much he affected every relationship I've had since I've been an adult. And she told me, please tell every single person you can about this story so that it never happens to another kid. Thankfully, this conversation, plus some of the other things that he did, got him put into federal prison for the rest of his life. It, it raises a good point, though, just so you know, that we work these proactive investigations. We are online posing as 12, 13-year-old kids. Um, we are doing a lot of work on cases that sometimes never amount to anything. But when we do make efforts to identify somebody and we find out that they're a position of authority or trust, all game's off. Like we stop everything and we move to grab somebody. Access and availability for an offender is key because if they have that opportunity or that access, they will become a hands-on offender. That's just the simple fact. So we try to nip that in the bud the minute we find out about it. And that's what he did. He was like, whoa, pump the brakes. We need to get this guy. He's a pastor. And it's happened a lot. I was just telling Tony on the drive down here that on a Wednesday night, I was chatting with a guy who said, I can't come meet you on Friday because I'm raping a 12-year-old Friday night. And I said, oh, crap. We've got to get down there. And he was in Houston. And so the next day was spent getting a warrant, and the next day was driving down here and arresting him where we found a lot of CSAM material, and he's now spending 10 years of his life in prison as well. The real world cases, I'll let Tony tell you about this one. So Carly Ryan, this is a very near and dear case to us, uh, though we played no involvement with this case. 
Carly Ryan was the first teenager in the history of Australia's uh, time of being groomed online by an offender, uh, lured away, uh, raped and murdered. And as a result of this, she was communicating with a kid who she thought was like a budding rock star. You know, his name was Brandon Kane. Uh, said he was here from Texas, but was off in Australia doing his like rock star life. And so in actuality, Brandon Kane was a 50 year old man uh, named Gary Newman. And Gary Newman was posing online. He was very prolific. He had hundreds and hundreds of online profiles. Uh, he had a, a, a pretty well uh, established game, uh, but he would ramp things up if things didn't go his way. Um, a whole bunch of things happened, and we're going to just give you the bare bones, but Carly was having a birthday party. It was going to be a birthday party at home, and she was going to have a little slumber party with friends uh, afterwards, and the other people would leave. Well, her boyfriend, Brandon Kane, was supposed to show up, bring her a gift, and then at the very last minute, of course, because he's not a real person, uh, he had to back out because of some rock star gig that he had, but his dad conveniently was going to take his place, bring the gifts, and so Carly went to her mom, Sonia, and said, hey, this is what's going on. And Sonia, as a mom, and remember, this was 2006, 2007 time frame when all of this was happening, the, the online part of it. And she was like, what? No, I don't even know this guy. Like, that's not happening. And so she talked to this guy, Gary Newman, and said, hey, look, I don't know you. I'm not giving you my home address. All the things we would, as a parent, would say, yes, this is right. So she met him in town. She's like, I'll meet you in town. We'll talk. She did everything correctly. She looked at his ID. She looked at his shirt. He had a, an embroidered work shirt. She looked at his car. She had all of this information, and there were no red flags, none. And so she allowed him to come over. And that turned out to be, unfortunately, a very bad situation, nothing that she had any control over. She saw some red flags immediately within a few hours, ended up kicking him out, and the next day, Carly was gone. And so... Sonia Ryan, we met her through happenstance. Carly was ultimately found on a beach in uh, Australia. This is a scene, this is a picture from that scene. The police over there did an amazing job. They combed, I think, what was it, 140 kilometers. A lot of a space. Lot of space. this is a beach crime scene yeah. with a rising tide and rain. Yep. That's what they had to contend with um, to solve this crime. And so Sonia, her mom, basically turned what would be the worst scenario for any parent on the planet into the biggest triumph and tragedy, uh, the, the worst tragedy into the biggest triumph. And she started the Carly Ryan Foundation, and the Carly Ryan Foundation was formed because back then when this took place, the laws were not adequate for online offending. And so Sonia, she doesn't take any no for an answer. She's a very, very strong woman. Uh, she does it solely for the love of her own daughter, and so she had federal law and state laws uh, created as a result of this so that no other child would go through that. And so we are fortunate that we met her. This is us at the... Uh, she's battle. like a sister to us now. She is. She's part of our family. Our, our wives and kids know her. her. Calls me a thick bitch. She does. <laughs> she does. <coughs> yes, Wonderful. She does. She's, so, she's so in everybody's face and she just doesn't take no for an answer. This picture is proof because she said when she came here, she now lives in Texas, uh, and she's bringing the Carly Ryan Foundation, an American version here, to protect kids. And so when she came to us and she's like, what do you guys need? In a much cooler Australian accent than I can say. But we said, well, look, we, we've been working on some legislative stuff and we need this and this. And she's like, no problem. I'll get us a meeting with the governor. And me and Brandon are like, whatever. Like, that's not happening. Like, it's not happening. So like a week goes by and she goes, hey, what are you doing on the 20th or whatever it was? Uh, well, we're working. Well, I need you and Brandon to drive me to Austin. We have a meeting with the governor and his executive staff. And we're like, we did. What? And so this is with us. Taking indoors, in taking rotunda. names. She's like, let's wait, go. I was like, wait, I think we should tell our bosses that we've been working on this. And, and, and I was like, they're probably going to want to know we're going to go meet with them. And so we went and met with the executive staff. We went down there with one meeting in place. This is us in the rotunda in, uh, at the Capitol. Uh, and it turned into three or four meetings and a lot of phone calls later. Um, it was a it was a tremendous thing, and we are honored to uh, to have her in our lives. And she's doing a lot of work around the country. She's testifying. She's met uh, in Washington, and and doing a lot of proactive work to change our laws and to bring advocacy to kids in the U.S. as well. Um, so we always like to honor uh, Sonia and Carly um, for what she's gone through and the millions of kids she saved because of Carly's story.
So this is the question we get asked the most. What apps are dangerous? And we you might want to take pictures of the screen. Feel free to take pictures. You're welcome to do so. We used to say any app where a child could communicate with another person is dangerous. And that is still true. We will, sadly, we've gotten to this place. We're going to show you what we believe is the most dangerous app or apps. Um, but let's go through a few first. The gaming apps. Now, people don't think of gaming apps as being dangerous, because what? You just play games. But a lot of these gaming apps have communication features to them. And so kids begin communicating with someone on the gaming app and then leave the gaming app and go elsewhere at the direction of these people that they're talking to. Um, another thing that, kid, that parents often forget about is when a kid is gaming, sometimes on those headsets, they're talking to people and the parents can't hear who they're talking to and they're talking to adults all around the world. Um, so some of the things we've seen, all of the apps that we're showing you are apps that we have seen or worked a case on. Um, and one that I just made an arrest on just last week happened on Discord. Um, and Discord, I call it the internet relay chat of the 21st century because it is just the same. It is servers and people just chatting all day. And there are all sorts of servers and there, as is with any app, there are absolute good reasons for it. It can be a perfectly legal and good place to be, but the predators have made it a dangerous place for kids in ways as well, and it's a place where they're sending exploitative material. I, I literally arrested a 40-year-old man last night at about 10 o'clock who came from a Discord issue involving a 13-year-old girl in another state. It, it's happening every day, every day. Messaging stuff. What uh, you've seen already? You've yeah. seen the, uh, um, oh, we haven't got to, it's the next one. But yeah, Omegle. Omegle's been around for uh, over a decade. It's been around since the early 2000s. And it gained popularity again because it is a completely anonymous, connects you to a random anonymous person. And you can either chat by typing or more commonly, you do live face-to-face -face video feed with some random person across the world, which then leads to, in our experience, a lot of times them moving the child to another platform to continue speaking. Kick um, started as a messaging app for kids back in around 12 or 13. Kids were on it. Kids are no longer on it. Now it's just predators and they are sending a lot of exploitation. And then the others, Wicker, um, Telegram, Signal, a lot of predators use these because they're end-to-end -end encrypted, so they think, well, I can't be caught on them. Um, that is not altogether true, but because of that, they're using these apps a lot. Now, Google Hangouts is just one that we've seen predators move kids from other platforms to there. Um, but what you should know about these are, look there, some of them, Google is listed as 4 plus. And what, safe. what we say about 4 plus, um, well, our friend Chris Hansen says, wait, what? No, as seen in the App Store, apps in this category contain no objectionable material. That is not always lie. the case. Absolute lie. Video conferencing, this was a big thing when uh, COVID first hit and we saw a lot of uh, young people that were forced to go online and do classes and all this. And if you're in the room and you're an educator, you may have experienced some of this. There was a lot of Zoom meetings that were getting hacked and CSAM was getting uploaded uh, to a room full of kids. Uh, there are a lot of problems with these. Uh, you have to be very careful. So you have to make sure that things are password protected on both ends. Um, Skype, he, all of I those. Saw Skype, you know, all of the pastor all stuff chats. with Skype, yeah. yeah. That was all through uh, Skype. And most people think, oh, it's just video through Skype, but there is a chat typing feature as well. Um, social networking apps, Yellow, I'm sorry, Yubo used to be Yellow. It was a dating app for kids and um, av advertised. Um, whisper is a place where you post a random whisper and then people respond and there's a direct messaging component. Be Real has taken off in the last couple of years. It requires the user who's communicating to randomly take a picture every so often with the front and back camera and it's supposed to be, you can't, fo you can't fake it, you've got to be real because it just takes this picture and it shows both sides. Um, and then Instagram and, and Snapchat, we'll talk a little more about Moco Space. You want to talk about Moco yeah, Space? Let me tell you, if you have a child in your life that has Moco Space on their device, they are receiving sexually explicit material, probably images, solicitations. Uh, this place, this platform is a cesspool 
a cesspool for predators. Um, so you need to be very, very cautious and be checking the devices of those loved ones that you have control to check. Um, I have been groomed many, 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 many times on this platform, um, and it has led to many, many, many arrests, I promise you. And I promise you they're disappointed when Tony shows up. It's hard to get in those little girls' clothes, but when I do, like, it's, <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, okay. <laughs> Snapchat. Yeah. We, we, this, yeah, this is the bane of our existence in law enforcement. So I try, and, I try and explain it this way. Think about it. When it first started, what was Snapchat designed for? It is designed for pictures and videos, right? And they're made to, what's the word? Disappear. They delete. Or so the kids think, and some predators think so too, but they don't, and a lot of the predators know how to keep them. Now, let's add on to those videos and images that are disappearing where the parents can't find them again. The Snap Map, um, and I'll show you some of these. Here's the, here's the, the platform right here, the memories of Snapchat. Here's the Snap Map. It used to be on by default, now it's not, but it's very easy to turn on, and it will locate you down to several meters away. This is where I was in Dallas-Fort Worth at that time. Now we're going to add on My Eyes Only, an encrypted container where people store their pictures and videos, oftentimes naughty, and it contains a password-protected encrypted vault for those pictures and videos. So I ask you, what on this green earth could a child under 18 have a need for Snapchat. It is not designed for a child, and yet every child in the school acts like it is a perfectly safe and every other kid has it, and they're all using it. I tell people this, I have never worked a case with a real child who has been exploited that did not in some way have Snapchat built into the case in some way. We arrested a teacher and put him in federal prison who told the judge at sentencing after he had terribly exploited this child and hands-on abused her. I just thought I wouldn't be caught. That's why I did it. And he was using Snapchat. We used to be kind of cautious and play the, the common line of saying, well, they're all bad. Um, that changed after we directly had a conversation with the top legal advisor for that, that uh, app, uh, where we were just like, hey, what can we do to bridge the gap? How can law enforcement work with you to help protect kids better? And the words from his mouth to Brandon and I directly were, we can't be seen working with law enforcement. And so we were puzzled. We were like, what? So the motives of this app are horrible, and they are literally the bane of our existence. What Brandon said, that every single case, they all involve this. And this is, I think I've just lost this one, so. It's because you talk too much. I'm just going to take yours. <laughs> the next one is has become very mirrored to Snapchat um, because they've brought a lot of what Snapchat is doing to their platform, and that's Instagram. Think about Instagram, it's, it's transitioned to vanishing DMs, it has a live video feature, um, and then kids know, they call it their Finsta, their fake Instagram versus their real Instagram, and so what they, are able to do is, you remember that we said that they have a secondary account, they're able to toggle between multiple accounts very quickly so when a parent comes and doesn't know about Instagram, well here's one of those techniques that we want parents to know about. If you hold down the icon there, you can toggle between one or more accounts very quickly and toggle out of that account when your parent comes back and then move to the one that they are allowed to see and that allows them to go between their Finsta and their Rinsta. Blogs. Some, yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, a lot of these are really, really problematic. Uh, and again, while some of these have some useful qualities, I mean, I like TikTok. I you, TikTok's like, the uh, funniest stuff on the internet. Yeah, I like YouTube. You. I, I watch so much YouTube. My gosh, it's crazy. But there are some components on YouTube, Tumblr, Reddit. Those places are having horrible child exploitation material that's being shared. It's being generated, and we know that kids are on this. Remember. Everything that we tell you, everything we do from a proactive stance, from a reactive stance, when a report comes to us, is all based on real things that we've seen or experienced in cases. And so all of these have their equal problems, uh, you know, for kids to be just having unfettered access. I had a guy who shared tub on Tumblr um, things that he had created using with his six-month-old daughter. Uh, and so he got to spend 20 years in 
federal prison, but Tumblr was the platform he was using. A lot of what we're seeing on YouTube is kids are self-producing and uploading things on YouTube and then get their accounts shut down from that. TikTok, I'll be, I'll be very open with you. TikTok has been, from what we've seen, very proactive in how they're trying to work um, with law enforcement. They took it upon themselves before anyone else did to extend the time they keep information to give to law enforcement to 180 days from 90 days, and that was done even without law enforcement pushing them to do it. I would say they are really like the tip of the spear with uh, working in conjunction with law enforcement, uh, and that's really just a mindset. And, and we physically met the guy that handles their legal side, and it's just the complete polar opposite, a whole 180 degree difference between them and like Snapchat. So we'll go quickly through these. The only thing that you should know is kids are actually creating Tinder accounts, Bumble accounts, Meet Me accounts. And what's dangerous about this? They're geolocated. So rather than finding someone that's a million miles away across the world, this is the person that's just a few miles away from them in their neighborhood. Um, also, the same, you know, the uh, same sex oriented uh, are the same. We've been kickoff grinders a number of times, um, professionally, not personally, but um, grinder has been a place where we have seen child exploitation occurring. Um, and in fact, I've, I've got a lot of people in prison because of grinder and them meeting for what they thought was an underage boy. This is one that some people don't know about at all. Some people are like, oh yeah, that's been around a while, so we want parents to know. Hidden vaults. There are apps that act as hidden vaults. And if you don't know that that exists, well, first of all, you need to know it exists. Second of all, you need to know maybe what, what to look for. Um, some of them are very apparent. Vaulty, private photo vault, those are apparent. You want to talk about Hide It Pro? Yeah, Hide It Pro is a music manager. So you can download it, and you know a lot of young people have a lot of music on their phone. A lot of adults have a lot of music on their phone. It will take every bit of music on your device, and it will categorize it for you in that app. However, it also has a vault, a hidden vault. You open it up, you enter in a certain code, it opens up a vault. I personally arrested a guy who had over 900 videos of child sex abuse material stored in that app, and he stood there talking to me as confident as he and I would stand here and talk because he thought, they're never gonna know this. I just happened to know what that was, and I just looked at him, I was like, I know, what's the code? And it, oh, he gave me the code, there it was. And this next one, I arrested a firefighter who had all of his CSAM in it in this calculator vault. He also had all of the inappropriate pictures he had taken of 9, 10, 11 year olds at Disney World while he was on vacation. And so the calculator vault acts as a real calculator and then when you put in the code, it takes you to what oftentimes our predators are storing their horrible pictures. I'll give you an example. This is what it looks like. This is the app itself. And when you open it, it acts as a real calculator. So we're not really good with math because we're dumb cops. So two plus two is four. And I'll show you that, you know, dumb cops, we need this too. Four plus six is 10. And then I divide it by two. And that takes me to five. And then I give my code, one, two, three, four. And it opens up, not to show you dirty pictures, it's gonna show you pictures of my puppy Jack and my puppy Jack and Hatch. Yes, Jack's a sweet puppy and Pepper, and my big ugly head. And then what you have too is the opportunity to set this, fill, this gesture so that when you do one of these gestures, it will automatically shut the app down. Or you can set it to disguise mode to look like an error where you enter a certain code and it will fix it. And then it has places for notes, a wallet, um, and other things within this app. But if you don't know what the app looks like, then how would you know it's not just a normal calculator? So that's why we show you these things. Well, one of the things, just to emphasize that, because that's a question we get asked a lot, because well, it looks just like a regular calculator. People are creatures of habit. So are bad guys and so are a lot of kids. Nobody wants to pay for anything. So you'll probably see a banner ad or a, a 20 second ad is gonna pop up. Well, then you gotta know that it has some other capabilities. So the punchline is when it comes to any of these things that we've shown you tonight, just remember, no matter what, there's going to be an app for it, and you just have to understand what they do and how to make your child's device safer. And we're going to show you that right now. There are apps and organizations. These are several apps that are just built for 
monitoring your child's device, a parental monitoring software. Um, there are tons of them out there. Or there. None of these are ones that we specifically promote because they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, some of the big ones are Bark, Zift, um, Google has one, Verizon has one. Thorn, again, that was um, Ashton Kutcher's company that he started. They have a parent portal that they will give you resources and teach you about some of the things we've talked about tonight if you want to dig in a little further. That's their parent portal right there, thorn.org. Another one is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They have this wonderful thing called Kids Smarts and Net Smarts, and they will, these are designed for kids the really young ones are, are designed for the uh, kid smarts, and then the net smarts is to the older ones. Um, and they have videos and things to teach your kids about online safety. And then they have a parent portal as well that allows you to get resources for free. They have resources for teachers, including presentations, so that you can um, dig into some of the information and also give the resources that you can use for your own self stuff. Yep. Uh, again, we talked about the Carly Ryan Foundation. Uh, why we pay homage to this is because when Sonia told us we were beginning, we have a, a podcast that we do, and that podcast is called Catfish Cops. Started out as a way to like tell stories about cases we work. It's really morphed into far more than that because we really believe in the education component of things. We believe in the awareness of things. We're never going to arrest our way out of this crime type, so we have to change the whole paradigm. And so for us, we list, we have a resource page, catfishcops.com forward slash resources and on this resource page if you don't understand something about an app go hit the application settings go hit the third-party apps and what it will do is it's going to automatically link you to the Carly Ryan page Sonia told us when we were doing this she's like don't reinvent the wheel I got a whole staff of people that do this and update it all the time link it to us and we just share and so we give this resource to cops to parents everybody you can get a one page fact sheet to tell you, hey, this is what the app is, if it's something you never heard of, and you know what, here's some recommended settings to help protect your kiddo a little bit better. There's other things on there. Uh, there's a whole list of different things. This is a big one, the family contract. I'm a big believer in this. I use this with my own family. I did this with my own kids. And this is a way to have a good conversation starter, right? And we're gonna give you some analogy here in a minute about why we think you should be so intentional. Instead of having one talk with your kid about this, you should have multiple talks. You should lean in as often as possible. And so now what? We've set the house on fire. <laughs> what happens? So, yeah, this is? goes back to what do we do? First of all, learn the apps. That's our first tip for parents. Learn the apps. And there are plenty of places to do it. There's this wonderful thing, you know, the feds, special agents at the at the federal level. I call one that I, I call on a lot for resources, uh, my good old friend, Special Agent Google. So just Google it. Google that shit is what they say. I just didn't want to say it. Uh, Google that stuff. GTS. Go online. There are plenty of places. There's Common Sense Media. There are just places that will tell you what is this app, what is the, the age range. The app stores will generally tell you that. But learn the apps. They're the same apps that you're using. You just have to learn how your kids are using them. We say know the passwords. You should know every child's password to every account, every username, and if you don't know the password because that kid won't tell you the password, well, guess what? The phone or the device is a privilege, not a right, as is their bedroom door. Privacy, we hear this a lot. Private, what about my child's privacy? Privacy is for the bathroom. Now, with that said, the bathroom can be one of the most dangerous places for a child online because a lot of kids know I will never the, a parent will never invade their privacy in the bathroom. So if they're taking their devices in the bathroom, they know that's a safe place where mom and dad will never know what's going on. So that's another thing we caution. Kids don't, sh should not take devices in the bathroom. My kids, this is a big one for them, they want to take something to listen to music while they're in the shower or whatever. And I just tell them, we have a digital Bluetooth speaker. You set your thing outside, your device outside, and the Bluetooth speaker inside will give you your music. You don't take devices in the bathroom. It is a hard and fast rule that we never break. The other one, uh, as Tony said, be intentional. At the end of the day, it's a parenting issue. You can learn the devices. You can learn the, the passwords. You should be checking their devices. I always say, check it at 3 a.m. when they don't know you'll be checking it. Randomly take it. I often see my, my kids are so used to me taking their devices. They know that all of their conversations I'm going to go through, their friends know, whatever they send, 
dad is looking at so they don't ever send inappropriate stuff because I'm always going to read it. One day I said, give me your devices, and I kind of took it, and my now 14-year-old was 12. She goes, wow, that was rude. You know I'm going to give it to you. And I'm like, yeah, I do know. You are going to give it to me because they're so used to me taking their devices all the time, being nosy, being reading through everything. Um, one of the things I equate it to, we have this idea that online safety or body safety or sexual development, those things, that's the talk. You know, how many of you guys are over 40 like me? None of you, exactly, because you're all under 30. But we grew up with this idea that our parents have the talk, right? You know, and it was the most uncomfortable thing, and you're like, the talk. You teach your kid when they're a little bitty, two years old, maybe, to brush their teeth, right? You stand them in front of the mirror, and you go, this is how we brush our teeth. And you show them, and you demonstrate, and you do it for them. And for a while, you're demonstrating, and you're showing them how to brush their teeth. And then as they grow older, you tell them, hey, to brush your teeth. Make sure you go brush your teeth. As with my now 10-year-old, when she was 6, 7, and 8, I'm like, that's twice a day minimum. Uh, brush your teeth. And now my 14-year-old, your breath stinks. Go brush your teeth. Have you brushed your teeth today? I think your teeth are growing stuff. Go brush them. We have that talk from the time they're little bitty all the way until they're grown up. But we want to have the one talk about internet safety, child predators, sexual development, and child sexual abuse, and that is not okay. We must start from the time they're a little bitty talking about age-appropriate, body safety, body development, using the right and correct words, and then have the talk. If you're so open and honest with your kids from the time they're little all the way up, I promise there will never be a talk, and there will never come a time when they will feel like they can't come to you with something that's going on online. In fact, my kid, this just happened the other day, my 12-year-old came to me and said, Dad, one of her friends told her, a friend at school showed her some a pornographic image, and it really bothered her. And she said, I didn't even see it, but it bothers me hearing about that she's bothered, and I just don't know what to do. And it was such a wonderful opportunity where I saw, first of all, what we preach works. Because she came to me, and it wasn't even involving her, but she wanted to let me know so that she could find out what to do for her and what to do for her friends. We got to have a really nice talk about, look, this is what your friend might be dealing with. These are some of the feelings they might be dealing with. These are what their parents need to to know we're going to have a talk with their parents because they were bothered just by seeing some image. Imagine if they're being extorted or something like that, how much worse it's going to make them feel in the shame and the guilt. Have anything to add that I've talked, talked, talked? No. You did great. So what happens now? We've set the house on fire. We've scared you. You're going to go home and scroll through your kids and loved ones' devices. Uh, we have some practical things that we would tell you to take away from some of this, right? Let's move it. It's not on there. Oh, okay. So let me just tell you, don't panic. Don't freak out because that's what happens. Two, two typical ways this happens, right? Mom finds out, here's the one thing that you can do that will really, really harm the situation. This is by trying to take over and use the account to help us, the police. I'll just keep talking as though it's I'm my daughter. That way, when I do tell the police, they'll have a better case. That is wrong. That sets up an automatic defense for a bad guy to say, I knew it was mom the whole time, even though it's complete false. So don't do that. Never take imagery that was sent to one of your kids and forward it to your own device so that you can wipe it from your kid's device. That's and, what we hear. We hear the, yeah. I just wanted to get it off my kid's device, so I sent it to mine and erased it off theirs. And that I'm is like, a crime in Texas. That is, you cannot do that. And now they're both evidence. <laughs> yes, and then you have the chance of losing both of those. If a father finds out something, the conversations are a lot worse. Usually it's like, hey, guy, I know who you are, and I'm coming to your house, and I have my flamethrower and my hatchet, and I'm going to chop your house down and set you on fire, and then I'm going to call the cops, right? Don't do that. Your kids are not going to come forward if that's the kind of approach that it takes. Call someone with your local agency. If they don't have an ICAC investigator, they certainly have a resource to find one, and we can help point them in the right direction. And lastly, don't freak out. If your kid comes and says, hey, this has happened, don't freak out because they're looking for your response to tell them how they can proceed and how, if something else happens in the future, they react the next time. 
Be calm, cool, collected. You might die inside a little, but go fall, call your local police department. I promise you they have the resources to handle any situation like this. We go all over the country teaching law enforcement how to do these kind of things, and so I know that the resources are available. We would love to answer any questions, comments, complaints, and if we have any from the Zoom as well. So now is the time. We're really good at awkward silence, too. So if you want to sit here for a while, we will. Yes. Yes, and parents, look, having the conversations, that's really the be intentional is our motto. If you're intentional about taking the steps to learn it and having the conversations, your kids are going to trust that no matter what they come and tell you, it's going to be fine. And you're going to feel like no matter what they tell me, I'll know how to handle it. Any other questions? Any? Okay, so the question is, is there any correlation between someone who is a predator also being a victim? Uh, now, I'll say this first. It's, it's not going to be any surprise. We're not psychologists. You know, we're not that smart. But the research does say that although a person who is victimized as a child sexually, perhaps, there might be higher likelihoods of criminal behavior later, often it's not abusive towards a child. What we hear um, victims say is, I would never, if they were a victim, I would never do to another child what was done to me. And so that's actually been termed uh, a term called the vampire theory, you know, that once you're bitten, you would bite someone else, and it's been widely discredited. Um, so there is higher likelihood of criminality, but not child sexual abuse offending. And so a lot of times what we see is the predators use that to gain sympathy, and tr because, you know, what is it going to do? It's going to make you feel like, oh, well, they were abused, so of course we're going to have sympathy, to and that's why, they, that's why it's been spread. The common sense is a vast majority of our child sexual abuse victims are female. The vast majority of our child sexual abuse offenders are male, and so if that were true, then we would see it flip-flop, that we would see most of our offenders be female um, because they were victimized. So it's largely discredited, and um, I think a lot of child sexual abuse victims would be highly offended by those predators using that as an excuse. Uh, Brandon, I have a question here online. Uh, what is the best way to become a child exploitation detective? Mm. I would love to bait predators online. It has been very interesting <laughs> oh, yeah. to learn about this. Okay, very good uh, question. And so I'll answer this in two parts. The first one is uh, become a cop if you're not already. And if you are a cop, uh, do some time on the street and learn how to be a real cop. Don't try to move into being a detective within the first year or two. Uh, you need some valuable street experience to get there. But once you do have some experience, become a detective and work child crimes. We are strong, strong advocates to come from uh, that crime type because you just get a base, a foundation built on how to work with kids, how to work with a multidisciplinary team and whatnot. Which we're gonna talk about tomorrow. Yep, yeah. we are doing that tomorrow. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about quickly is you said something or the person said something about, I would love to bait people online. There is an entire paradigm of vigilantes that are out there that are doing this now. They're on all these social media platforms. They've got hundreds, sometimes millions of followers and we would tell you this, that is terrible. It's absolutely horrible. And here's why. They are going to hurt a real child because what they do is for the likes, the money, the subscription or whatever it may be, and they get the instant fame from this. And so they bring this person in and we have no idea what they said to get them there. They probably entrap them in some level. They don't follow rules like we have to follow rules. And so when they bring this person in and they shame them publicly and then put them out there on social media, our, our response to that person who's doing that, the vigilante, is this. Do you think that this person's going to stop that behavior? And sometimes their response is like, well, they, yeah, they're going to stop. Because they can't be prosecuted. That's what he said. Right. They can't and, be prosecuted. But are they going to stop? The reality we know, because recidivism is very, very high, 
we know that they're not going to stop. And so what that means is the next time they do this offense, they're going to demand real material from a real kid. And the chances of them getting it are really high. So as a result, these vigilantes are hurting real kids. They just don't know it at the moment because of the thumbs up or the subscription or the monetary benefit or what that may be. And we as a as a detectives in this crime type, we're not allowed to take those cases at all. And ch what we know about child abuse outcry to, p to kids that outcry outcrying against sexual abuse is, it doesn't happen um, all the time. In fact, the statistics are shocking about how a majority of sexual abuse goes unreported for years, if not ever. And so what we know is if kids are not outcrying to abuse, and this person has requested something that, that leads to the real abuse of a child, it may take re multitude of children being abused before they ever get caught again, if they ever get caught. And so that cyber vigilanteism, that going and doing predator hunting and getting your likes and subscriptions, and, and we say that because we've talked to some of them and told them, you're harming real kids, you're putting real kids in harm's way, and they've told us, oh yeah, we'll stop, but they don't because it's their financial, it's their money, it's their likes and subscribes, and so what we see is they don't care about kids, they're, they're actually out for their own fame, and we don't want real kids harmed because they're trying to get likes. Another and sad fact of that is if you read the comments, if you go and follow one of those pages, because that's just something you like to watch, the shaming of somebody for that, and you'll see that the person that makes it, that vigilante, will put in the comments, I tried to give this to law enforcement, but they turned me away. And all the comments are like, oh, boo, keep doing right, you're doing it. But they, it doesn't bother to tell them there's rules and there's reasons we can't take that because we have made efforts to talk to them. Any other questions from online? We have a couple, but before I, I do, I wanna just uh, let everyone know tomorrow morning at 9.30, we are gonna have a panel with uh, our two friends here, Catfish Cops, Brandon and Tony, but we're gonna have a panel also with uh, people from the um, um, uh, Child, Advocacy, uh, Child Advocacy Center in Houston. We're gonna have a local uh, police officer. We're gonna have a child advocate. So we're gonna have a panel of eight people to talk about the multidisciplinary nature of child exploitation cases. So we do have a couple questions here. One fella says, uh, our experience at Sheepdog Bloodhound Internet Safety is that a child or a youth on a live streaming app will in almost 100% of cases be solicited for CSAM at minimum. Are there any known statistics for such platforms? Uh, the short answer to that is... Um, experience, yes. Yeah, from an experiential side, yes, we could tell you. Uh, I am familiar with that organization. Um, again, it gets oftentimes looked at as a vigilante group because it is just people whose hearts are in the right place. And don't misinterpret what I'm saying. There are people whose hearts are in the right place and want to do what they think is good it's just, it leads to so many problems. For us, we want it to be a good prosecution. We want to put someone in prison who has this, uh, this propensity to go and sexually abuse a child. That's what we want. We don't want them to have that opportunity ever again. So there's so many rules that we have to follow in order to make sure that that's a solid case and it's built correctly. And we see oftentimes, even though the the we're like Gilligan on the island. We are by ourselves sometimes, and there's not enough of us that are available. He gets old. Yeah, I am old, he if you don't know who Gilligan is. Right after Moses parted the <laughs> That is true, and I was smart enough at the time to train this guy how to do the job, so I must have done something right. But uh, the same fellow wants to know, he's, he, or he's saying, his, our, our general advice has become get your young family members that are under 18 a flip phone. A small yeah, smart, well, smart device. there's some theory to that. The stupidest choice you can make. There are flip phones out there for this, I mean, cricket phones and things like that. Um, there are common advice, because people have said, like, how old should I have my kid be before we get them a smartphone? We can't decide that. It is based on your child's maturity level and things like that. But generally, most social media apps you can't be on until you're 13 or older. So we use that as our guideline and we say that this way. You would not, now I jokingly say this, but this was the case when we were growing up, but you would not give the keys to your car and tell your, your kid, go down to the store and get me milk and bread. 
you know, you would not give your nine-year-old the keys to the car or your 10-year-old the keys to the car. But we're giving kids this device that accesses the world of information with unrestricted access. And more importantly, people are, have for, for a long time been worried about stranger danger. They're worried about that white van at the end of the road. The, the sad truth is the offenders are coming into your child's room at night through that device and you're asleep in your bed while your kid's doing horrible things online. We just heard the story from a, a father who's spreading the word about his son who was extorted on Instagram. And it started at midnight, and it went until 3 a.m. when his son got the gun and killed himself. It happened in three hours. And he said, if only my son had come to our bedroom, woken us up, and told us what was happening, we would have loved and supported him, gotten him through it. But it happened that fast, and it was happening in his room because he had this device that had unrestricted access to the world. And so with that at stake, what we have to say is 9, 10, 11 is just too young for a kid to have a phone, especially a phone with all of these apps on it. So if a flip phone is your answer for that, then great. If a watch that does messaging only between you and geolocation is it, great. If not, if you can only do what you can do to give a phone to a nine or 10 year old, we don't like it, but I say lock that sucker down till it cannot be used in any other manner than you allow it to be used. And that's really the takeaway. But what, when, what, what do you do when you know something bad is going on if the child doesn't let you know? What are the calm approaches you can take? What are the calm approaches that you can take when your child does let you know? Ooh, well. That's a very good question, and again, we would reiterate, don't freak out, don't panic, don't, don't respond in a manner that's going to shut your child down. As much as you may be disappointed or hurt or upset with what they bring to you, you have to keep a calm and level head. I would second the fact that you need to tell your child and embrace your child, I love you, I'm going to get you through this. I'm here for you, and we will work through this. Don't, don't worry, uh, we're going to make it and then get the police involved. You, you, you can't do your own independent investigations. You cannot do those things. You need to get the police involved. And if you have an agency that's close by that doesn't have it, there are plenty of resources for them to reach out to to get it. Uh, but I think the bigger takeaway is be intentional. Don't flip out. Tell them you love them. Go from there. My advice is tell them thank you for trusting me with this. And we're going to go to people who know how to help us out of this. And honestly, if you don't have a local agency, there are federal agencies that know exactly what to do or who to direct you to at your local agency. So if at very least go to a federal agency or the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has a cyber tip line and you can make a report through them and they can get you to your local agency as well. All right. So does anyone have any questions, any more questions here in the room? Hold on one second. Hold on. He's you, a mic. you show the, the signs, but how about if the kid uh, is afraid, but they don't want to, to say, um, this has happened to me. So what's your recommendation? They should go to psychologists, therapists, to talk with someone because they're sometimes afraid or they're ashamed to, to share these things with your parents. So if you're afraid, you're, you're, she's asking if a kid is afraid to share that with their parents. Yeah, you, see, you see the sign that that you share, yeah. like he's acting different, but the kid don't want to tell you what's happening. And sometimes that is the case. Sometimes they're so, that, that's what we see when kids, kids who have been abused sexually tend to tell their parents in ways that they're testing the waters. They start testing the waters about telling to see how much reaction they get. And typically we see before a final outcry comes out, they've tried to tell, and sometimes the worst case is they told and no one believed them, but sometimes they'll test the waters. But a majority of our cases come from outcries to teachers and counselors at school. So what we always say is if you don't feel like you can tell your parents, trust a caregiver or a trusted adult in your life. So what we do is we talk to our kids and we tell people who have kids, tell your kid from the, the earliest age on, have three trusted adults in your life that you can tell something bad that's happened to you too. Your parent, an aunt or uncle, a grandparent, 
a counselor, a pastor, um, a friend's parent, something like that. And so a lot of our outcries come from school teachers. Uh, and that's why during the lockdown, it was really, um, for us, it was sort of stressful because we knew kids are home sometimes with the offenders and aren't able to outcry to the people they trust most. And so um, what we, we see is a lot of kids do tell their, their teachers or their counselors at school and those outcries get reported because we're all mandatory reporters in the state of Texas. So I have two la uh, more online questions real quick. How can social workers get involved with this line of work? How can a social worker get involved in this kind of work? Um, do your own due diligence when you look for a nonprofit group. There's plenty of nonprofit groups for someone who's not in law enforcement to volunteer their time or their efforts or their money if they're able to do such a thing. Uh, there are lots and lots of things that need to happen for this whole process to work. We believe strongly in a multidisciplinary team, and that takes a lot of people and a lot of effort. Not everybody's a paid person that does this. A lot of people just out of the goodness of their heart will go forward to say, hey, I want to do this. What can I do? I can give you my time. I can give you my money. I can give you this and move forward in that arena. You need to clarify too. He's to clarify what he means is in this field of work. What he's not saying is proactive undercover investigations oh, yeah, yeah. because by law, those are only allowed to be done by sworn personnel, law enforcement, because remember, you're going to be dealing with CSAM and that can only be done by sworn law enforcement because it is a crime to possess or distribute and all of that stuff. So to get involved in the work, that is the organizations that he's talking about, NECMEC, the local advocacy centers, things like that. But to do the proactive undercover work, you have to be law enforcement to do that. Right. And our last online question, we have one other question from Dr. Goins, but our last online question is, are there free events or programs that we can take our kids to so they can see the danger that they can encounter with social media? You can. Uh, you can check, uh, depending on where that person is from online, you can log in and check with the, uh, the ICAC task force. There are three main hubs here in Texas. Uh, North Texas, where we are, the Attorney General's office in the Austin area, and then Houston ICAC has the, uh, the rest of the state. And so you can check with them because there are programs. Your local Children Advocacy Center will have personnel who could provide trainings. We obviously uh, come and do these sort of trainings as often as we can. We go teach all over the country for law enforcement, but while we are teaching there for a week, we also try to give back to the community. We try to come and do these community events where we can educate people because that's what we believe is really going to end this. Educating more people, raising more awareness, getting more involvement, and so that's what I would suggest. We're not getting younger, we're getting uglier, so we're going to do it till we die. Yep. And Dr. Goins? So I had a question. Um, if y'all ever retire, y'all would make great radio talk show hosts because y'all have a voice. <laughs> like movie phone. There you go. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, there's a reason that Brandon has such a beautiful voice is because he was a professional opera singer she has before. A, she has a question, please. She has a question. Well, now I want to hear an aria. Oh, she knows what an aria is. Oh, we're almost out of time. What was the question? <laughs> Question, okay, so before I was in academia, I was in adult protective services, and I'm still on the, their board, and I give trainings on elder abuse. And so during the pandemic, um, the statistics changed as far as the type of perpetrator. So it's always traditionally been the adult male son who out the spouse beats the, you know, the, the adult daughter, the grandchildren. But what we saw during the pandemic was that the grandchildren shot ahead of the adult oh. male yeah. son. Yeah. So my question to you is, what kind of, or did you see any change or trends or statistics during the pandemic when it came to the type of perpetrator or... Um, I'm just curious. That's a brilliant question, and I love it because we have an answer. The question, the, did everyone hear the question was, how has the offender changed since the pandemic? What we have seen um, by far and wide is the offenders have gotten much, much younger. So we've seen this huge shift from an older 35 to 45 year old white male offender now to as young as 17 and 18 and Typically, the younger offender, what we're seeing is the more heinous the CSAM and the um, exploitation material, as young as infant toddler rape and abuse. And we're seeing that on platforms like Discord. So what and do you think that's about, the age dropping like that? I th well, I mean, 
again, I'm not a psychologist and I don't, I don't know the real answer to this. I just take it from my experiences that these platforms have changed in the way they're using them. And so our, our offenders have historically been getting material and interacting with people on certain platforms that as they age, the offender ages as, as well, but we see new platforms that are being used in new ways. Like I said, Telegram and Kick was not used as an, as an adult platform in 2012 and 13. I remember hearing a kid talk about Kick and going, what is that? And they're like, oh, all the kids are on it. And now kids would, like, we've heard kids say, I wouldn't touch Kick. I haven't, I haven't been on Kick in seven, eight, six, seven years. It's because the platforms as they're, as they're evolving and changing, the, the younger kids are getting on the newer, more cutting edge things, and they're experiencing new ways to, you know, some of the younger offenders are the dark web. One of the, the most prolific dark web administrator was a very young man under the age of 30. And so, you know, as the technology is advancing and, and the ways that are, uh, are changing in technology, I think the offenders are younger because they're used to getting onto the newer platforms. A lot of the older offenders, you know, we, you're talking about Tony's dealt with older offenders who have had printed material and Polaroids, and now, you know, that's, that's had to evolve even in our legislative language. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. Anybody else? Uh, it's all yours first, sir. How has the development of AI impacted these types of investigations? That's a great question. And there's one that we don't necessarily have an answer to yet because we ourselves from the law enforcement community are trying to come up with a baseline, some protocol. It's, we're seeing it's, it. We're seeing it, absolutely we are seeing it. And how to address it is what we are, are concerned with and how it's gonna be implemented and used. There, there's all kinds of things as far as charging and, and things that violate current law. Do we need to create new law? It's coming. Um, but we are behind the power curve for sure. And I think we're seeing it. The AI is is generating new material. The crossover between real and, and artificial is happening in the CSAM world. But what we're running into is our laws and our case law have not gotten to the point where it's sufficient to address it. So the conversations are being had and at, at national levels as well to discuss like how do we combat this you know we've seen this uh, and this isn't something we generally talk about but um and i know that i'm pe some people it just destroys their world to learn this is even a thing but we've seen for the last 10 years this thing this change in laws and and viewpoints around child sex dolls you know dolls that are made for uh sexual purpose that are built to look like or designed to look like a child in both size and design and the laws don't really, you know, haven't kept up with how to address those. And so we've sort of seen, you know, legal things changing uh, about how to even address that. So I think the AI thing, we're way behind in it. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's only going to become more prevalent, and uh, as is the encryption yep. issue as well. So there's not a good answer, but there is, there is talk about it. It is something that is currently in discussion. Good question. One more? Is that a hand up? We saw Go one ahead. more. Oh, here's a microphone, please. <laughs> Put you How on the spot. many years of experience, like, for, like, I guess, to be in cop or in the law enforcement, would you recommend before getting into, like, the detective work? For I, <laughs> I'm kind of an old school uh, person in that regard. Old. Took, That's the word he was old, looking for. Old. old school cop. But it literally took me 12 years to get to the level of where I. I felt comfortable. I, I really felt comfortable around my sixth or seventh year. Like I was like, okay, I think I know every aspect of what I what could I encounter as a as a patrol person who's responding to calls and you know working with the community and those kind of things. And so like I try to tell young officers now, like pump the brakes a little bit, get some real life experience. In some departments, if you're in a major department like Houston or Dallas or Austin, somewhere huge you're going to get that experience much more rapidly than you are if you work for, you know, Kima or, you know, some smaller little agency around here who just doesn't have the call load or whatever. So it's a, it depends on where you work, on what you do, what kind of crime type you have in your environment. It's all there, but don't rush it. 
pump the brakes. There's plenty of time to get in and plenty of time to do a bunch of great work. I would add too that, and this is something I've told to people coming into our child crimes unit or going into crimes against children in general, Think about what's required. Anyone can file a case and be a detective, but think about what's required in crimes against children. You're trying to get someone who has done the absolute worst thing to a child, something that even murderers and robbery suspects, people in prison that are there for heinous crimes, dislike and hate child molesters, right? And child offenders. And so when it's such a taboo thing, you're trying to get someone to admit to doing something that is horrible to a child and is already taboo and will be outcast for what they've done. And you're trying to get them to confess to that. And so to me, the takeaway is to get into crimes against children, you need to know how to talk to anyone and get them to tell you their deep, deepest, darkest secrets. And to do that, to me, you learn that from working the streets and just talking to people as victims, as witnesses, as suspects. Everyone lies to us. We just understand that. Everyone lies to cops. You know, and if you don't believe it, just even the soccer mom on her way home from soccer practice, when she gets pulled over, when the cop goes, do you know how fast you were going? She goes, oh no, officer, and you're lying because you know how fast you were going. That's okay, we get that. But learning how to talk to them through that and like figuring out the lie and how to, to get them to tell you the truth around the lie, those kind of things, that's what's important in child crimes. And so to me, I say, six, seven, eight years is about the time where you're like, okay, I can talk to anyone, you know, sell a, a used car to anyone kind of thing. That's where you're gonna be a good investigator in child crimes. Hold on, you're making her run. Last question. But I, I'm so like, uh, uh, I don't know how much how much do you say work in the law enforcement when someone uh, is a pedophile? How long is going to the jail? And and the and because I, I went to some some court case with Mr. Villano to see. Uh, I think so sometimes uh, the crimes is increasing around the world because if the if I'm pedophile, yeah, I'm not have money. Sometimes they pay the amount and they go out and continue doing crime because this is a big yeah. b business that it's ge generated by the child exploitation, right? It's tons of billions because there are people who consume that or some is pedophile, but to, to solve the crime, it's very hard because uh, I see like uh, money can buy everything. Yeah, that, that's a difficult question that for us to really answer because it varies from county to county. It varies from a state charge versus a federal charge. Where we are in Texas, we see greater, stronger sentences on the federal level. And so that's why we choose to, he's a TFO with FBI. I was with HSI for several years. It's why we choose to partner with our federal partners because where we are, it's far greater chances they're going to prison. And that's our ultimate goal. Like. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that we have someone who does this crime type with a child, that they don't have that availability to do that for as long as humanly possible, uh, because we know that statistically they're going to probably reoffend. Uh, but that's where uh, you as the citizens come into play. You start to see that you're having offenders who are not getting time or they're able to buy their way out or probate a case. Well, that's up to you to then elect those people into office who can put in place the sort of changes that need to be made. The courts are based on, and the sentencing coming from courts, are based on the community input. Yep. I mean, we've had prosecutors and courts tell us. They are basing their, their decision making on community input. So it's incumbent upon a community to tell the court system how you want things addressed. And that comes through advocacy, you know, vo vo voicing your voice as much as you can through uh, elections and voting, but also through your legislator, your representatives, and things like that. So, Corey. Thank you. One other thing I wanted to, um, to kind of add on to all of this is that um, I think that there's sometimes this thought, and I'm not thinking that anyone in this room has this thought, or at least I would hope they not, but that people that are in possession of CSAM materials are totally different than the people that are committing contact offenses uh, with children. And the data actually indicates uh, that's completely untrue. Most people, um, and I don't know how many cases they've worked or could attest to, 
but that are found in possession of CSAM material have had a contact offense with a kiddo. They just either haven't been caught or the child hasn't disclosed. Um, but so these are, this is a very, very dangerous territory. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a, at this point, I feel like it's a public health issue um, and something that we all need to be um, concerned about. So um, thank you guys so much. That was great. Um, I want to thank, <laughs> yeah, it was good, right? And like, not, not as bad as we all maybe thought of, right? From like the advertising related to this, right? Like, it's a tough topic. Did we destroy your work? <laughs> it's a tough topic and maybe you leave and you're a little shooken up, but you should be, right? Um, and you should leave knowing that you're empowered with information to affect change and to prevent victimization. This was a tough conversation to have, but it really wasn't all that scary, right? You learned some information, and now you can go out and take this great information that you've, you've received from these two men and spread it, okay? Have these conversations, normalize these conversations. If we can talk to our kids about, you know, what to do in the event of an active shooter situation, um, surely we can talk to kids. That's a scary topic, right? What to do in an active shooter situation, that's a scary topic, right? Surely we can talk to kids about how to keep them safe and to know um, that there are people that they can trust and people that love and care about them that they can come and have these conversations with, okay? Math so, is a scary conversation. Math, sure, al algebra. algebra. Oh, that's why I'm a CJ major, because we do very little <laughs> math. Um, again, thank you guys all so much for coming. We will have another event tomorrow. They're gonna, they agreed to stay. We, we kept them here for another day. And we'll have a whole panel of other people that in their investigative capacity they've worked with in various positions. So forensic interviewers, people that interview kids, advocates, attorneys. So if you're interested in kind of getting the professional feel, I heard a lot of questions about how long should I do this before I become a detective? Or you have those kinds of questions. That's a really great, uh, we have over like 115 years of uh, child abuse experience in that panel. So, um, so come join us tomorrow, okay? Thanks so much for coming guys, it was a pleasure. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Okay.